Thank you very much. I'd like to begin by thanking the National Archives for inviting me to share my book with you. And thanks to everyone out there for spending this time with me. I hope to make it an interesting part of your day. Let me begin by telling you a little bit about myself. This is the third book I've published. First was The Great Sweepstakes of 1877, written about the first great North versus South race following the Civil War. Next came Diane Crump, a horse racing pioneer's life in the saddle, which tells the story of the first woman jockey to ride at a major American racetrack. That book won the 2020 Tony Ryan Book Award as the best racing book of the year. And now we have the first Kentucky Derby, 13 black jockeys, one shady owner, and the little red horse that wasn't supposed to win. Next slide, please. First Kentucky Derby, uh, I need the next slide. That's good. The first Kentucky Derby tells three important stories. How America's iconic horse race, the Kentucky Derby came to be, how Aristides, the first Derby winner, won the race despite his owner's best efforts and fervent wishes to win with a different horse, and how and why African-American jockeys who were once a central part of American racing and who rode the vast majority of the horses in that first Derby ultimately left the sport. Now, the exodus of black jockeys was near total. Unlike other sports in which increased diversity, sometimes after decades of being denied access, has universally improved the quality of the game, race riding in America was multiracial from the beginning, primarily because so many enslaved men proved to be gifted riders. But after African-American jockeys were largely expelled from the sport as the 19th century became the 20th, they never returned. Today, I'll discuss some of the reasons for this tragic history. But before exploring these issues, I think I should spend a moment explaining the three elements of my book's title, 13 Black Jockeys, One Shady Owner, and The Little Red Horse That Wasn't Supposed to Win. Next slide, please. First, 13 Black Jockeys. The first Kentucky Derby had a field of 15 runners. 13 of them were ridden by African-American jockeys. In 1875, this was not an unusual situation. In fact, newspaper stories written about that first derby didn't even mention that the majority of the riders were black. It simply wasn't news. It happened all the time. Before they largely disappeared from the sport, black jockeys won 15 of the first 28 Kentucky derbies. My book also features one shady owner, and there's the man himself, the extremely shady Henry Price McGrath, owner of the first Kentucky Derby winner, Aristides. H. Price McGrath had one goal in life, to take your money. He went to great lengths to accomplish this. During the California gold rush, he set up crooked card games to relieve the miners of their hard-earned profits. During the Civil War, he lured soldiers into alleged games of chance involving marked cards and fixed dice. This earned him a year in federal prison. Did I mention that the Price McGrath was shady? And he purchased his stable of thoroughbreds, and a good stable it was, with his gambling winnings. This wasn't the man to invite to your friendly neighborhood poker game. He reportedly once won $100,000 on a single hand of cards. In modern funds, that would be approximately $3.5 million. Not a bad day at the tables. In addition, he was not about fixing a horse race. Sometimes he fixed races so that his own horses would win. Sometimes he fixed races so that they would lose. The wager was the thing. If he won his bets, even on somebody else's horse, that would be good enough for Henry Price McGrath. Next slide, please. And here we see the little red horse that wasn't supposed to win, Aristides, the bright chestnut colt that Price McGrath considered the less talented of his two Kentucky Derby entrants. Aristides was supposed to take the early lead in the Derby and set the pace for his stamina-rich stablemate Chesapeake, who was expected to fall behind the speedier runners early but charged past his tired rivals in the stretch run. McGrath's gambling money was all on Chesapeake to win, and if Chesapeake could win the race, he was going to earn a fortune. But Chesapeake apparently didn't feel like exerting himself that day. As we sometimes say about such horses, Chesapeake never picked up his feet. What happened next became the stuff of legend and racing history, but I'm going to delay sharing that legend with you for a few brief moments because that part of the story belongs with Aristides' jockey, 
Oliver Lewis, and we'll meet him shortly. Next slide, please. The story of the first Kentucky Derby begins with this gentleman, Colonel Mer Merriweather Lewis Clark, the grandson of General William Clark of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Colonel Clark, seeking to promote racing in Louisville, traveled to Europe in 1872 to see how the best tracks conducted the sport. But this was more than just a mere racing vacation. Louisville has seen a number of its racetracks open and close, mostly for financial reasons, and its last track had shut down years earlier. Louisville didn't have a track. And without a racetrack in Lexington, in, in Kentucky's largest city, the value of land and horses had become stagnant. After all, why buy horses in Louisville when you can't race them there? Why buy horse property when people aren't interested in buying horses? And so the Colonel's European trip was the hope of Louisvillians to save an important industry. And I might add, the man who may have saved horse racing in Louisville was all of 26 at the time he went to Europe. The Colonel reviewed everything there, European betting machines and European flower gardens, European grandstands and European stable ponies, when he came home in 1873, he brought back to America plans for a new racetrack that would one day bear the name Churchill Downs and ideas for a collection of races that he believed would become American classics. One of these modeled on a classic race of the British turf was also given its name and would come to be known as the Kentucky Derby. By any standard, Colonel Clark was a historic figure in American racing, but he also proved to be a tragic figure a victim of melancholia, which today we call extreme depression. He committed suicide in 1899. He was 53. Next slide, please. That first Kentucky Derby was run on May 17, 1875, and it was a very different race from the modern day run for the Roses. To mention just a few of the major differences, the distance was a mile and a half instead of the current mile and a quarter. That took place in 18... 96 to avoid owners and trainers boycotting the race altogether because they considered the distance too long. The track wasn't known as Churchill Downs yet. That wouldn't happen until 1883. People arriving at the track that day came to the Louisville Jockey Club course. The twin spires that you see in the left picture had not yet been built in 1895. The original, in 1875, the original grandstand actually faced in the wrong direction. Race scores had to squint into the sun to follow the progress of a race. This was finally corrected in 1895. There was free infield admission if you arrived in a horse-drawn vehicle. There was no blanket of roses for the winner. There was no official trophy. You can see on the, on the, the right, the modern version of the, of the trophy, which came into being in 1923. My old Kentucky home was not sung that day, and there was not even a starting gate. The starting gate hadn't been invented yet. The starting line for the first derby was a string stretched across the track above a line that had been carved into the racetrack soil with a pocket knife. What sent the field on its way? A man down the, down the, the track waved a red flag. The, the official starter yelled, go! And the man next to the official starter beat a rat-a-tat on a drum. And that told the, told the jockeys, time to start. Next, next slide, please. The next two slides memorialize the man who trained and rode Aristides to his derby victory. Aristides was trained by an African-American man, Ansel Williamson, who was born in 1810 or thereabouts and began life as a slave. He may have begun his racing career as a jockey, or maybe not. We simply don't know that much about his early days. But we do know that it took many years before, his, before racing historians compiled a complete enough record of his victories to prove that he belonged in racing's Hall of Fame. He was finally inducted in, in 1998. And even with the work those historians did, it's likely we'll never know his complete record. Part of the reason for this is that the official race, racing records of the day sometimes didn't bother to list his victories. He was a black man. It didn't matter quite as much as the white trainers. Sometimes they misspelled his name or changed it to Ansel Williams. Sometimes the official record excluded him altogether. And as a matter of fact, uh, Williamson lived most of his life, his adult life anyway, in, in Lexington. And upon his death, his obituary in one of the major Lexington newspapers was titled Death of Ansel Williams. So that was, that was unfortunate. But he, continued, he, he conditioned the winners of many an important race, the Kentucky Derby, the Belmont Stakes, the Withers, the Jerome. He won races that were important in their time, but long ago dropped from the racing calendar 
some at tracks that no longer exist, some in states such as Tennessee and Alabama and North and South Carolina, where thoroughbred racing is just a distant memory today. This painting by equine artist Edward Troy shows An Ansel Williamson at the extreme right-hand side, the rather distinguished looking man with the beard holding the saddle uh, and preparing the horse asteroid to go to the track. This is the only known depiction in existence of Ansel Williamson. Next slide, please. Aristides was ridden in the jockey by 19-year-old African-American jockey, Oliver Lewis. As I noted earlier, Lewis's instructions that day were very specific. He was to set the early pace for Chesapeake, then maneuver Aristides out of the way so that McGrath's favorite colt could win and earn McGrath a small fortune with his wagers. And here is where we'll discuss the legendary result of that first Kentucky Derby. Aristides took the early lead as Lewis followed instructions perfectly. But when Lewis and Aristides reached the final turn with that big derby field stretching out behind him, McGrath, who was standing near the top of the stretch, could see that Chesapeake was laboring at the back of the pack. <clears throat> he recognized that his derby wagers were going to be losers, but that his other colt could still win the race, and he became caught up in the excitement of the moment. He began waving his hat, pinwheeling his arms, and shouting at his jockey, Go on with them, Oliver. Go on with them. So Oliver went on with Aristides, and McGrath gained immortality as the first owner whose horse won the Kentucky Derby. But it was the wrong horse, and he lost all his bets that day. Next slide, please. For more than a century, race riding in America was a sport in which African Americans excelled. The biggest names in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s included the likes of the incomparable Isaac Murphy, William Billy Walker, Lonnie Clayton, James Soup Perkins, Willie Sims, and one of the greatest ever, Jimmy Wink Winkfield. They overcame the prejudices inherent in the sport in post-slavery America to achieve greatness in a sport that increasingly just didn't want them around. Murphy is believed to have won more than 35% of his races, but he claimed that the correct figure was 628 wins and 1,412 starts, 44.5%. No modern day jockey, needless to say, has ever come close to those percentages. Murphy was also the first to win three Kentucky Derbies in 1884, 1890, and 1891. He held that record for nearly 40 years until Earl Sandy won his third aboard Gallant Fox in 1930. The two shared the record for another 18 years until Eddie Arcaro won his fourth derby aboard Citation in 1948. Jimmy Winkfield was the last black man to win consecutive derbies in 1901 and 1902. The next, time, the next time a jockey would win consecutive derbies would be 1972 and 73 when Ron Turcott were above one aboard Reaver Ridge and the Great Secretariat. But the greatness of black jockeys in America goes back much further to the earliest days of slavery. Next slide, please. In early accounts of American racing, black jockeys won many, many a race. But even, even the greatest of the black jockeys were treated as property. A black rider might be known as Ned or Cornelius or Simon or a hundred other names on the race course. But most slaves were not permitted to use their last names, which might imply that they had a separate human existence apart from their owners. Look through old sporting newspapers and you'll find advertisements. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jockey for sale, as you might sell an old plow horse, plow or a feed bag or a set of horseshoes. Owners would loan or even lease their riders to their friends and business associates. And at the end of their riding careers, many of them jockey would be returned to the farm to help train the next generation of enslaved jockeys. It was in existence with almost no chance of escape. But occasionally, even under the bonds of slavery, a jockey in the rarest of circumstances might earn his freedom by winning a big enough wager for his owner. Next slide, please. Which brings us to the old Oakland racetrack in Louisville on September 30, 1839, the day a jockey known only as Cato won his freedom. It was one of the great match races in history, pitting Wagner, brought to Kentucky from the Deep South, where he'd proven undefeatable at New Orleans and Mobile, 
against Kentucky's own reputed super horse, Gray Eagle. And a brief note about Gray Eagle, he wound up being the father or the sire of Traveler, the horse that Robert E. Lee rode through the Civil War. At stake in this race were unknown but huge amounts of wagering dollars, plus a $14,000 winner take all purse. That translates to about a half million in modern dollars, and most of it would have been put up by the two owners as a side bet. And if he could guide Wagner to victory and earn those wagering dollars for the Southerners backing his mount, freedom had been promised to his jockey, a tiny black man known only as Cato. In attendance that day were 10,000 spectators, some in the stands, others in the tall oak trees surrounding the course that gave Oakland its name. One was prominent Kentucky statesman Henry Clay. Terms of the race required the winning horse to take two of three races, but Wagner sent everyone home early by winning the first two consecutive heats. Some Kentuckians had wagered not just their money, but also their saddle horses on the outcome. They had a long walk home that evening. And Cato, having earned his freedom, was last seen circling the track aboard the winning horse, waving his 14, 000, with the $14,000 prize money over his head. After completing his victory lap, he leapt off Wagner, handed the money to the winning owner, and rode his own horse into the Kentucky sunset, a free man. Next slide, please. By, 19, by 1896, however, what might be called the golden age of black jockeys in America was nearing its end. Oh, African-American jockeys were still winning plenty of races, but things were beginning to change. Isaac Murphy, once the highest paid athlete in America, died in 1896 at age 35. That's, that's the man called the Prince of Jockeys on the left, one of the original group of jockeys inducted into Racing's Hall of Fame. He officially succumbed to pneumonia, but his true cause of death was probably the starvation diet he used that left him vulnerable to illness. Many jockeys of that era died young, trying to make weight. In 1902, Jimmy Winkfield, that's him on the right, won his second Kentucky Derby and the last for 120 years won by a black man. But by 1905, the man known as the Black Maestro was on his way to Russia, forced out of racing in America by a combination of death threats and declining mounts. Years later, Winkfield would insist that Russia, the land of the Tsar, the breeding ground of the Bolshevik Revolution, had been a far more liberal environment for black jockeys than America, the land of his birth. Winkfield's record in the saddle will never be equal, that's a certainty. He won two Kentucky Derbies, a Clark Stakes, two Moscow Derbies, three Russian Derbies, five Russian Oaks, two Warsaw Derbies, a German Grocer Price von Baden, and a Grand, <clears throat> and a Grand Prix de Deauville. Imagine what his record might have been if he'd stayed, stayed home in America and just gone after his own country's race. But continuing with the approaching end of the golden age of the black jockey in America, <clears throat> in 1911, Jess Conley finishing third aboard Colston became the last Amer African-American jockey for 112 years and counting to finish in the top three in the Kentucky Derby. And in 1921, Henry King finishing 10th on an 81 to one shot became the last black jockey to ride in a Kentucky Derby for 79 years. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. But even as the golden age waned, African-American jockeys were still winning between 1890 and 1902. In fact, black jockeys won eight Kentucky Derbies in 13 years. Isaac Murphy won in 1890 and 91, Lonnie Clayton in 92, James Soup Perkins won in 1895, Willie Sims won in 1896 and 1898, and might have become the first jockey to win three consecutive derbies if he'd been able to ride in 1897, but no one would put him aboard a horse. And of course, Jimmy Winkfield was the winner in 1901 and 1902. But not long after, those days were gone. Next slide, please. Today, seeing a black jockey at the racetrack is a rarity. It's difficult to get a precise count of the number of African-American riders because the official records don't indicate jockeys' races or ethnicities, or for that matter, even their genders. I've seen one estimate suggesting a percentage of 4.9, which would be less than one half of the percentage of the population comprised of African-Americans. Another writer determined that 30 of the approximately 750 members of the Jockey Club, a jockey's union, are African-American. That would equate to about 4%. All I can say is that those percentages have not been reflected in the race, racetracks I visited. The original Kentucky Derby finished 13 black jockeys. After more than 50 years of attending the races, 
I'm not sure I've seen 50, 50, seen 13 black jockeys in my lifetime. And let's look at the modern day sport and ask some more questions. Are black jockeys today able to get mounts in rich, important races? Do they have access to the best horses? Can they ride for the biggest purses? In other words, is it possible today for an African-American jockey to move into a higher tax bracket by winning an important horse race? The numbers from the Kentucky Derby are, are discouraging. Let's take a look. In 2000, Marlon St. Julien became the first African-American rider in the Derby since the Roaring Twenties. He finished seventh. In 2013, Kevin Krieger finished 17th behind Golden Sense. In 2021, Kendrick Carmouche, the gentleman pictured in the slide, and Borbonic finished 13th. And that's it. There were no black jockeys in the 2022 Derby. And when they announced the starters for this year's race just yesterday, the names of African-American writers were once again notable by their absence. So crunching the numbers, that's three winners with black jockeys, three runners with black jockeys in 23 years in America's iconic race. There were 435 derby starters during that time. So those three lonely African-American jockeys comprise far less than 1% of the derby's total riders. Do the same calculation for the 39 years Breeders' Cup has been in existence as America's championship weekend. And I'm willing to bet that the percentage wouldn't be much different. With rare exceptions, black jockeys simply don't get mounts in the richest, most prestigious American races. Which brings us to the next question. How could the nearly wholesale excess of an entire race from American thoroughbred racing have happened? Next slide, please. Looking at the events of the era and also what was going on at the same time in American thoroughbred racing, I found 10 possible causes that I thought might have led African-American jockeys to abandon the sport of their ancestors, or in some cases to be abandoned by it. None of these was decisive in itself, but think of them as a cascade of falling dominoes that land one upon another to ultimately deny African-American writers their birthright as leaders in this sport. The 10 most important causes appear to be the 1876 presidential election and the end of the era of reconstruction, the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court ruling, which allowed so-called separate but equal facilities, the smaller derby fields in the 1890s and 1900s, economic downturns affecting America, more white jockeys entering the sport, black jockeys own continuing success, the reduction of the plantation system following the Civil War, the ages of jockeys, the roles of owners and trainers, and last but sadly not least, the racism of the country beginning with slavery. Let me explain each of those and how they impacted black jockeys in America. Next slide, please. Let's begin with the presidential election of 1876. Republican Rutherford B. Hayes, the man in the photograph, versus Democrat Samuel Tilden. Over the years, we've been through a number of close and sometimes bitterly disputed presidential elections. Among others, there were the 1960 Kennedy-Nixon election, the Bush-Gore hanging Chad election of 2000 that wound up before the Supreme Court, and of course, the Biden-Trump election of 2020, which some still question. But Hayes versus Tilden may have been the most troubled presidential election in history. Let me tell you about it. Tilden won the popular vote, but the electoral vote was, was disputed in four states. An electoral commission was formed to sort things out with Republicans in the majority. And so, as you can imagine, in the end, the Republican Hayes was awarded all four disputed states and victory by one electoral vote. In response, the Democrats threatened the second civil war. But cooler heads prevailed and, the, and revolution was avoided through what came to be called the Compromise of 1877. In the Compromise, Democrats agreed to recognize Hayes as president for four years. They weren't happy about it. He was referred to as Ruther fraud and as his fraudulency, but they agreed to recognize him. And the Republicans agreed that Hayes would never seek reelection. And most importantly for our story, that federal troops would be withdrawn from the defeated South. As a result of the protection being gone from these federal troops, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, abolishing slavery, bestowing citizenship upon freed slaves, and affirming, that they're, affirming their voting rights were gradually eroded through what came to be called the Jim Crow laws, which, among other things, compromised the ability of former slaves to find work, including work as stable hands, exercise riders, and jockeys. And there is one falling domino. Next slide, please. 
The second cause was the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court decision. The issue before the court was Louisiana's separate cars act. The question being considered was whether mandating separate train cars for black and white riders violated the constitution. The larger question was whether segregation of the races would be accepted as a matter of law with future Supreme Courts using the outcome as precedent for their decisions. The Supreme Court ruled the separate but equal facilities did not violate the law implicitly by endorsing segregating the races. And for some, the meeting was clear. One race was superior to the other and could separate itself from the lesser race. And which American sport was most integrated? Well, Jackie Robinson would not enter Major League Baseball for another 51 years. The NFL was just was decades in the future and basketball had been invented just five years earlier. But by 1896, black and white jockeys had been competing on the American turf for over a century. And now, in the words of Professor, Professor Catherine Mooney's great book, Racehorse Men, quote, racing became the athletic face of segregation, with all white racing commissions and board of stewards judging African-Americans' applications for jockey licenses and adjudicating foul claims involving white riders. Guess which side usually won? The separate but equal ruling was not corrected until Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, so that law remained on the books for 60 years almost. Next slide, please. Smaller derby fields certainly made it more difficult for black jockeys to find mounts for what was becoming an increasingly prestigious race. Bear in mind that the average field size in a Kentucky Derby since, 19, since, since 2000 has been 18.9 horses. For the 17 years beginning with Isaac Murphy's 1890 victory of Lord Riley, the average is 5.1. Among the reasons for the smaller field were the Derby's purse structure, which remained virtually unchanged for much of this time, and Colonel Clark's refusal to, re refusal to reduce the Derby's distance from the Epsom Derby's one and a half miles to the one and one quarter miles preferred by owners and trainers, who noted that their concerns were not being, being addressed and began voting with their feet, taking their top three-year-olds elsewhere. By the 1890s, the Louisville Jockey Club was in financial dire straits. The Derby itself was in danger of cancellation. In 1894, a new group calling itself the New Louisville Jockey Club took over control of the track and demoted Colonel, Colonel Clark. And two years later, the Derby's distance was shortened and its base purse was increased from $2,500 to $6,000. Nominations for the, for the race suddenly soared from 57 in 1895 to 171 the following year. And for the first time in, in over a decade, the Derby actually got eight starters, which was, seemed pretty amazing. Obviously, smaller fields meant fewer spots for black jockeys, and another domino fell. Next slide, please. Economic downturns in America certainly affected the, the ability of black jockeys to find rides. This is the period of the so-called <clears throat> of the so-called Long Depression, which is considered to have begun with the Panic of 1873 and is held by economists to have lasted through 1896. Some think it lasted longer. It resulted in reduced jobs, business, business failures, and racetracks were not immune. Several went out of business. First structures were threatened. Churchill Downs nearly went belly up and was sold in 1894 to the new Louisville Jockey Club. The reason for that was economic. By 1894, the original Louisville Jockey Club had paid dividends to its shareholders only once in two decades. None of this made for a more stable work environment at tracks that seemed close to failure. And here was another domino falling for black jockeys. Next slide, please. And as America moved into the 20th century, there were more white riders seeking the scarce mounds. A long held cultural belief in the South was that black men simply made better ride jockeys. I read a quotation from one Southern stable owner who said that black men were, quote, much more apt around a racing stable. They learn more quickly. They get along better with their mounts. And now we come to what might have been the most important factor. He added that black jockeys also work cheaper. This belief in the innate superiority of black riders begins to erode as the days of slavery fade farther into the past. And by 1900, articles such as one titled, quote, no more Negro jockeys, unquote, in the Chicago Tribune are increasingly stating that the time of the black jockey is past. That particular article noted that, quote, Few of the Southern stables employ exclusively black help nowadays. When they want exercise riders, 
the trainers almost invariably see white lads for the work. And of course, fewer opportunities in the stables and particularly in the crucial role of exercise rider, where so many jockeys get their start, meant fewer African-American riders being prepared for the future. And think about this. Under these circumstances, where do you find role models and teachers for young African-American men thinking about becoming jockeys? Increasingly, you simply don't. And there's another domino falling down, sadly down. Next slide, please. Black jockeys began to find that their own continuing success was a factor that those increasingly prevalent white jockeys were finding unacceptable. A case of too good for their own good. As African-American jockeys continue getting mounts and winning races, we see the beginnings of what today would be called backlash on the part of their white competitors. White jockeys increase their efforts to overcome through legal and other means their African-American rivals. They use intimidation tactics, form white jockeys unions, <clears throat> physically attack their black rivals. They demand directly to horse owners and trainers that they employ only white jockeys or else. In 1939, racing historian... <laughs> Excuse me. In 1839, racing historian Charles Palmer, discussing this history, described some of the tactics as follows. And please bear in mind that these are Palmer's words, not mine, and that his objectionable phrases are from a day and age when the niceties of speech were not always observed. So Palmer wrote, a black boy would be pocketed, thrust back in a race, or his mount would be bumped out of contention. Or a white boy would run alongside, slip a foot, a lot, foot under a black boy's stirrup and toss him out of, under the saddle. Again, while ostensibly whipping their own horses, those white fellows would slash out and cut the nearest Negro rider. End quote. Thank goodness. As one rider phrased it, there was race war on the tracks. Next slide, please. There were fewer racing plantations after the Civil War, but, and with the plantation system greatly diminished, an important source of training for black jockeys simply went away. Freed slaves leaving the South for work or education or just to escape their old lives encountered an increasingly industrialized society with very little interest in training young black men to ride horses. The result is fewer learning opportunities, fewer and less well-prepared black jockeys, and yet another domino fell. And I feel the need to add here that no one in his right mind would suggest that slavery in any sense is a positive. Think of slavery and you envision pure evil. But the South pre-Civil War plantations did train jockeys. And after the, after the war, that resource was no longer available. And those young black men who might have been pointed toward the racetrack pursued other paths instead. And the number of black jockeys was driven further downward. Next slide, please. You went past one. That's good. Even the ages of some black jockeys became a negative factor. In pre-emancipation times, black youngsters were rushed onto horseback, sometimes as preteens, to take advantage of their light weights. What's interesting is that the practice of using very young, very light black jockeys persisted beyond his slavery. It was a tradition that somehow died hard. It's no, condition, no coincidence then that the youngest derby winning jockeys are all African-American. Alonzo Lonnie Clayton was the youngest derby winning jockey ever at age 15. He's the one shown in this picture and he doesn't look 15 to me, maybe he does to you. Uh, but this picture was taken at about the time he won the 1892 Derby. James Sue Perkins, he was a few months older when he won aboard Helma in 1895, but still shy of his 16th birthday. The 1877 Derby winning jockey William Walker had made his first start at age 11 and was riding stakes caliber horses by age 15. He won his derby aboard Baden-Baden in 1877 as a very young 17 year old. Now one experience that many of us share is that as we leave childhood behind, we grow taller and heavier. Jockeys who had been hoisted into the saddle as teenagers were not exempt from this. And as fewer and fewer African-American riders entered the profession due to the causes we've been discussing, some of the successful younger black jockeys were in the process of outgrowing the saddle. And so Oliver Lewis retired from riding shortly after his derby win at age 19 or 20. Sue Perkins turned to training by 1905 when he was 26. Willie Sims retired from, for the, retired from the saddle at age 31. By 1900, Lonnie Clayton was planning to ride in Europe where the horses carried higher weights and the sport still welcomed black jockeys. But somehow he made a stop in California instead. 
It was there at about age 23 that he began his next career as a bellhop. Next slide, please. The owners and trainers and their dependence on their horses to pay the rent were yet another factor working against black jockeys. As white jockeys continued employing harsh and sometimes dangerous tactics in their efforts to defeat the African -American, their African American rivals, owners and trainers found it increasingly perilous to employ black jockeys. The potential for injuries to the horse was, was immense. White jockeys were known to line their horses up across the track, blocking the entire, the entire track and team up to prevent a black jockey from going by. We've already heard from Charles Palmer about other tactics white jockeys would employ against their black challengers. And sometimes both the rider and the horse would go down. Sometimes they wouldn't get back up again. Whatever they may have felt about the justice or injustice of the situation, horsemen were naturally inclined toward emphasizing the safety of their horses above all else. Often, this meant a forced switch from black jockeys to white. And yet another domino fell for African-American riders. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. And finally, I must focus on the effects of racism. When all is said and done, the downfall of the black jockey begins centuries earlier with the enslavement of one race by another. This created the mistaken idea that the enslaving race might somehow be superior to the race that was enslaved. As we're all aware, issues of race have endured in America to the present day. The competition between jockeys for more and better mounts is an ongoing element of the so-called sport of kings. It was there from day one and continues today. But in the days when black jockeys were being driven from the sport, this inevitable competition turned racial, white on black violence, black on white retaliation, in a political and economic environment that favored the majority race over the minority. And for all of the reasons we've noted, black jockeys were driven out of the sport. And with the exception of a courageous handful, they never came back. And yes, for the sport of racing, it is seriously an ongoing tragedy. That's the last of my slides, but before I conclude, I'd like to read you the short final chapter of the Kentucky Derby, 13 black jockeys, one shady owner, and the little red horse that wasn't supposed to win. This chapter is titled, It Could Have Been Different. It didn't have to be this way. It required a perfect storm of causes to create the tragedy that was and remains the nearly wholesale disappearance of black jockeys from American racetracks. And that perfect storm of causes might have been averted had only a few good people stepped forward to intervene. Had a few more stewards responded with fines, suspensions, or the ultimate threat, ruling aggressors off the turf altogether when jockeys of either race committed intentional fouls, African-American jockeys might have felt that their lives were being protected and that their careers were being treated seriously. Maybe they would have stayed in the sport. Had a handful of racing commissions refused to be cowed by owners and trainers and jockeys who wanted black riders out of what was, in their view, a white man's sport, granting license to applicants on the basis of demonstrated skill in the saddle rather than on the basis of race, African-American writers may have noted that their right to earn a living was being protected. Maybe they would have stayed in the sport. Had a few Supreme Court justices ruling on the Plessy versus Ferguson case had the foresight to recognize in 1896 what the Earl Warren Court did in the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision, namely that separate facilities for the races are necessarily unequal, then perhaps the momentum of viewing non-white individuals as inherently inferior might have been staunched. And perhaps black riders now recognize as morally and equal the, the equal, morally and legally the equal of their white counterparts might have stayed in the sports. There are dozens of instances in which the willingness to protect the rights of the races equally, the refusal to fall into line with perceived public sentiment, the insistence on doing what was right rather than what was politically expedient might have encouraged African-American writers to struggle on, defend their heritage, continue to compete in the pastime in which their forefathers had for decades competed. Maybe Jimmy Winkfield and Jimmy Lee and Sue Perkins and Lonnie Clayton and Willie Sims and their brethren would have remained in the saddle, remained in America. And maybe following their time, a new, young, exciting generation of African-American athletes would have found its way into racing. Maybe more than a tiny handful would still be in the sport today. But none of this happened and black jockeys found themselves driven from the turf. Other sports were open to the concept that athletes of diverse races should be allowed to compete equally. And in baseball, football, basketball, track and field, soccer, Black athletes have flourished, 
Even such upper class sports as golf, tennis, and figure skating have had their skating have had their black champions. Some sports needed time and what might be called moral suasion to reach the conclusion that including other races in the mix improves the product. But in the end, America's major sports were integrated and became better for it. But horse racing never provided the necessary protection, never provided the encouragement, never made the rulings that might have kept the great black athletes in the game. African Americans left as a group and they never returned. And now, but for a very, very few, they are gone. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to try and try and respond.